Good evening. Today, I would like to introduce my native city, the city of Irkutsk. The title of the presentation, Irkutsk, the Paris of Siberia. I'm Mikhail Rybalker, and I'm happy to see you for the second time. In this presentation, I decided to bring you lots of views of my own native city, uh, many peculiarities, something that you will not find in other locations. And today, I'll try to provide you with some very interesting facts that you might know, even if you live here in Irkutsk. The first thing that I would like maybe to connect with the previous presentation that I uh, provided a month ago is to show you again the sky, the clouds, Lake Baikal, Alhorn Island. And I specifically, in that presentation, when I talked about Lake Baikal, I didn't give the answer. So some of you who haven't seen that presentation, you might find it on the website of American Center. In that presentation, I talked about many unusual, uh, sometimes many uh, phenomena that cannot be explained. And one of the phenomena, of course, it's a beautiful sky of uh, Lake Baikal and especially Alhorn Island. And imagination, what do you see? Some people responded. They wrote to me saying that they clearly see the animal there. Again, uh, bringing your, uh, like drawing your attention to this slide, I want to, to show that again. And uh, some of you might see this is the cat. This is about mystery of clouds, of nature, many things that surround us here. And that, uh, again, we take it for granted that sometimes something that we can see. Nobody else probably can uh, explain that, but that's the reality of life in Siberia. Many, many interesting things around us. But before I want to uh, bring you to some uh, uh, Irkutsk sites, locations, I would like to show you the map of Russia, because this is for especially those who are watching right now from the United States, many friends of mine, I send the link and I invited to join this uh, presentation today. Uh, one thing that uh, people always ask me, where is Irkutsk? Because again, it's uh, not really that a city that many people know. Uh, people generally know about Moscow, St. Petersburg, then geography of Russian cities is over. Uh, not so many other cities are known. So in this context, I really want to show that Irkutsk is located in eastern Siberia, and it's actually in the southern part of Siberia. That's why it's not really that, I would say, well, it's cold here. This is another thing that many people usually hear, and when they hear about Siberia, they say, well, it's cold there. But it's also uh, much, much warmer than actually northern and central part of Siberia. So Irkutsk is located not far from Mongolia which is also a very, very actually cold country. And number uh, one, I think, um, the reason we have many tourists coming to Irkutsk, it's the railway. Yeah, this is a famous Trans-Siberian railway that goes actually from Moscow to Vladivostok. And that's uh, right in the middle of this railway, uh, my own city, Irkutsk. And that's usually the stop for so many tourists coming to our place. One thing then when we talk about Eastern Siberia as a tourist center, we clearly have many uh, people coming here simply to see something specific. They usually read about Lake Baikal. Well, it's nature. It's a lot of things that uh, people want to find out about life in Russia. Uh, of course, right now we don't have so many visitors. That's quite obvious, but at the same time, we have um, uh, still lots of international students coming here to study at many Yurkusk universities, and they stay and live here for a long period of time. I spend a lot of time with uh, American uh, Chinese students. Of course, most of my students are Russian students, uh, natives of this land. So, uh, the, for, uh, this is the very, very interesting monument that I provided here. And the Czech tourist is posing here, a uh, monument to a tourist. But one thing that really helped me explain where I come from, because people started asking me, and of course, when they say Irkutsk, nobody knows that. But then I realized, and actually my friends at Illinois Wesleyan, when I studied there, they said one thing, well, they know this city. It turns out 
that many people play a very famous game, Risk. It's not known really in Russia, but one thing I want to share to you that this is actually a very interesting game, Game of Conquest. It's the only uh, uh, winner game. Yeah, just nobody uh, uh, usually can uh, last forever uh, in this game because uh, it's a very long one. Uh, people uh, generally like to spend uh, the whole night playing uh, this interesting game when you really need to dominate, find, <laughs> find your own countries. Uh, again, risk might come to Russia. Uh, I have, uh, I think I, I, I'm the first person who brought this game, at least here in the Coast Cold, uh, I have shown to many, many friends of mine, and everybody was a little bit, I would say, uh, surprised, yeah, because it clearly says uh, there is a whole land of Irkutsk. It's much bigger, of course, than really Irkutsk Oblast. And um, uh, the game is also known for having a very, very big plot of like European part of Russia. Right now it's Russia. Before, in the 1990s, it was Ukraine. So, and again, lot, it's, it's a French game. It's actually not really an American game. And uh, again, the game is uh, really, really fan, uh, fantastic. But uh, I'm showing you Irkutsk, Yakutsk, Kamchatka, you can clearly see that, uh, again, this name uh, rings a bell for lots of uh, people, especially those who come from their mm, uh, universities. Well, uh, what is Irkutsk? Irkutsk, first of all, it's a city, but then it's actually a very large territory. We usually like to compare that many, many countries in Europe can be put on the territory on the uh, on the Irkutsk Oblast size. So it's it's huge. It's much bigger than France, of course, and several other European countries. Generally, Siberian territories are vast. Yeah, you can. It takes uh, three days, literally, here again to go from Irkutsk to Moscow, from Irkutsk to Almaty, to, from Irkutsk to Vladivostok, from Irkutsk to Beijing. So we are in the center of Eurasia, as we like to boast, and sometimes to say that uh, we are in the heart uh, of their uh, of, of Eurasian continent. So, uh, Irkutsk is a very, very large territory, uh, meaning that, of course, lots of northern territories are pretty cold. Southern parts are much, much better. But again, still, we have winter when, and lots of, this is a typical question from many, many friends of mine in America, how cold it was uh, when you lived there. And I said, well, it's usually minus 40 uh, in, in winter, uh, in, in January. Again, this winter was warmer. Uh, we hardly uh, had, uh, I think, any days when it was below minus 30. Again, minus 30, 40 Fahrenheit, minus 40 Celsius, it's pretty much identical, uh, the same. So uh, the, the, the temperatures in winter, of course, much cooler than in the European part of Russia. And the main reason for that is that we have the winds and uh, basically open terrain uh, in the north, coming from the Arctic. So remember, Gulf Stream comes to the Atlantic, brings all the warmth, but then it continues, it goes actually to European part of the country. That's why in St. Petersburg, it's much, much warmer because of the Baltic. It's actually relatively warm and, uh, warmer in Moscow, where, of course, the main problem is humidity in winter. Irkutsk is generally very, very dry. But then all these winds, all these torrents, they come to the area of southern Siberia, because there are no mountains. Mountains are in the south. Mountains are in the east, blocking us from the Pacific, blocking us from the southern winds. And in this case, of course, climate is, is much, much cooler and colder. Although, again, right now, and it's probably like a envisioning that some of you might ask this question, what temperatures are right now? Uh, it's about, uh, well, there were several, there have just been several days, Meyer plus 30 Celsius. So it's and again it's uh, it's pretty common in in uh, summertime to have very very warm days, but then temperatures go down again in uh, in the evening and at night it's much much cooler. But then again the sun uh, the sun warms it up. So uh, talking about another big thing, so simply to orient what time zone we live in, you know, since Russia has a large number of uh, time zones, we live actually in Beijing time. So Beijing, Mongolia, Irkutsk has the same time, time zone. So uh, five hours earlier than Moscow. So generally, uh, one thing that uh, lots of people uh, probably are a little bit uh, surprised, 
to see this title, Siberia and Paris, Siberia and St. Petersburg. Some, uh, I think this is what who citizens like to boast, like to say, well, this is something that we want to emphasize that we are special. It's one thing that uh, we usually like to compare ourselves. Of course, it's not really Paris. Of course, it's not really big as St. Petersburg, but it has its own beauty. It has its own, I would say, unique style. This is one thing that the Rakutsk is very different from other Siberian cities. I traveled a lot, and I've been, of course, to many American cities, many American states, uh, traveled uh, in, uh, in the Russian Federation. And I saw many cities, especially in Siberia, they don't have this, as we say, soul or unique nature or something specific again. And when we live here in Rakutsk, we... We take it for granted that all the city, uh, especially downtown streets, they should be historical. They should be well decorated uh, and lots of, again, wooden buildings. That's another big thing that Kursk is very famous for, keeping its wooden heritage. Another important moment when we talk about Rakutsk and why Siberia with uh, Siberia in Paris and Siberia in St. Petersburg, we need to re recollect Anton Pavlovich Chekhov who visited Irkutsk in the late 19th century. He traveled here, he traveled to Sakhalin Island, but Chekhov came here, and uh, Chekhov uh, really admired Irkutsk. He noted, he wrote that it's really an intellectual city, the city having um, its own uh, European type of the city life. Uh, that is, again, very, very different from other Siberian cities. So Anton Chekhov really saw that uh, Irkutsk is also very intellectual, having a lot of people who are called, in Russian, these are intelligentsia, intellectuals. This is the term which we need specifically, of course, explain that, again, people, uh, very well-educated people, that is, again, a certain feature of Irkutsk today, when we have lots of universities, lots of research centers, and that's when we really have lots of people who think about the future, who think about uh, many other aspects of life. So this is, uh, again, Anton Chekhov uh, talking about Rakutsk. Talking about uniqueness of the city, we um, often take for granted that the city you are born in should be pretty much the same anywhere else. And of course, when we compare Moscow or St. Petersburg, they truly have very uh, like I would say, uh, famous landmarks, a lot of uh, lots of different projects, lots of uh, beautiful architecture structures, something that we can admire uh, and visit and see. And uh, of course, lots of Siberian cities, lots of other regional cities, they cannot, of course, really have so much money for these projects. They cannot really provide something like splendid, uh, uh, like shocking in many cases. Uh, breathtaking. But uh, again, Irkutsk is very, very unique. And I realized, I think, when I lived in um, many other cities, where well, I usually visited many cities, uh, but in America, I lived in three cities that I would like to name, and perhaps maybe in the future I might talk a little bit more about my American experience. Um, I lived in the cities, and I uh, at first I didn't uh, really expect uh, them uh, to have... Mm, uh, maybe this like particular specific uh, lifestyle that was completely different uh, from what I expected in in, in Irkutsk. Um, again, the cities they would have uh, a lot of interesting things. Um, again, just uh, some people say ordinary cities, okay. But uh, at first, I lived in in Bloomington Normal for one year in Illinois, and that is that was again not far from Chicago. Uh, that uh, lots of wonderful people I met there, lots of friends I made, and again, this is uh, a unique place. Again, when you really like go there and see so many uh, interesting parks, again, universities, really hub centers of intellectual life. Again, um, the reason I went there, I was an exchange student. I came to America to study, and at the again, I returned, and I returned, and I, again, I really saw many, many other like states and uh, locations. The second city that I live for two years now, it was Muncie, Indiana. Again, another wonderful place. Another location that... Um, 
uh, again, lots of people think that uh, it's rather provincial. Yeah, it has its own beauty. The cities are much smaller, of course, than Irkutsk. Uh, but the cities also had lots of friendly people. And again, just uh, uh, that was my American experience when you really like uh, come, try to compare them uh, with uh, the world I knew in Russia at that time. And the last city, the way I spent seven years of my life, uh, uh, is a Lubbock, Texas. Uh, Texas Tech, where I went to, and again, uh, these are the cities that, uh, um, and again, when we really discussed that with my American friends, one thing that um, they lacked was, again, a uh, historical legacy, something that we see in our courts. And we take it for granted. We think, well, it's everywhere we should see some history, uh, historical monuments, historical features. Uh, again, even in Siberia, we find lots of cities created, uh, uh, built in the Soviet era, and they don't really have a lot of historical legacy. So in this context, uh, Irkutsk is uh, uh, rich in history. It really has all these connections that I would like to point out today that uh, really bring this story of history, uh, the story of Russia. Uh, because it's right in the middle. It's right in the middle of so many events that uh, would be surprised. Okay, Irkutsk is there. Irkutsk is there. Uh, the city that really uh, played a certain big role in, in lots of things. So one thing, when you go to these like American cities, downtown areas, they are very different. Downtown in Irkutsk, in Moscow, in many other locations, this is the richest place. This is the most expensive place. This is where you'd like, perhaps, to live. Uh, but, uh, again, in America, um, it, again, we are not talking big, about big cities, but when we discuss a lot of things uh, about life of the people, downtown areas, uh, well, sometimes they're not really in good uh, conditions. This is not really the place where lots of people want to stay, to want to live. They, they prefer to live in suburbs. And again, we have pretty much the same trend in Irkutsk now. Lots of rich people, lots of people who have ability and power, they would like to live, of course, outside of the city in the beautiful suburbs. And the same uh, trend is pretty much all, everywhere. Uh, but another thing uh, that I would like to say, the Irkutsk is different in many, many things. And it has, again, lots of lots of interesting things that really capture your imagination. Uh, first, uh, uh, there were pioneers of Siberia. These are the people, they're generally known as Cossacks, who founded many, many Siberian locations. And we have lots of monuments to them. The people who built Siberia. The people who came to, from European part of the country and again uh, settled uh, in this uh, fine remote areas in the 17th century. That's the city of Irkutsk, uh, located again, uh, uh, founded in 1661, okay, as a fort first, and then the city in 1686. The next uh, thing that I'd like to show here, it's again the place where Kuz really started, the so-called fort. When we take talk about Ostrog, it's very, very similar to when we really discuss uh, what is uh, in American and Canadian history is a fort, because it was pretty much the same time expansion of um, English, French, and again, Russian civilizations, and again, uh, the creation of forts, was pretty much like a uh, common trend uh, in Siberian history in the 17th century. So that's where the city really started. But uh, the next important thing that the Russians would build, uh, of course, a lot of stone buildings and there were churches. And again, it's religious life that uh, really changed when Russians came here, brought Orthodox Christianity with them. And for example, I have the picture of the very, very beautiful red, uh, like a church uh, in this uh, specific brick color. Uh, it's very well lit. It's one of this uh, fame, uh, one, of, one of the famous sites and landmarks of the city, Kazansky Church, where uh, again, um, Russian Orthodoxy uh, tried to change, of course, the minds also of the locals, of the natives. The Buddhists lived here on this land. And Siberia didn't really have a lot of conflicts because land was uh, vast. Uh, there were so many opportunities again for different groups to coexist, to trade, to find something in common. And so in, in reality, we didn't have that extermination of the uh, native uh, people um, um, as we uh, really could uh, get, of course, lots of stories coming from other countries. 
Um, so again, the beauty of the churches is another magnet of Irkutsk. But the reason why Irkutsk is generally is considered to be rich in architecture, it's the story of merchants in Siberia. Merchants, in Russian again, it's Kupci. These are the people who built all of this beauty of Irkutsk. And the reason why merchants were so exclusive and so powerful here, because this certain, actually rather small group, very, very high class of society here, they controlled the trade with China. So uh, merchants really profited a lot uh, from the so-called Kachta trade. Remember that historically China was actually closed, not really trading with any countries, again, except for the Portuguese. The Dutch tried to come here. It was only during the Opium Wars when China opened up. But uh, before the time, Irkutsk really prospered because a lot of goods, they could be traded, again, with the Chinese. And Irkutsk really controlled these uh, uh, roads. Uh, this navigation coming from Kakhta through the territory of the present-day Buryatia, uh, coming to Irkutsk and then sending everything to Moscow. And again, the city prospered. That's why, for a long period of time, merchants tried to build a lot of beautiful houses, and you have, for example, the view of the European house. A uh, very, very beautiful wooden um, architecture piece that is renovated. Lots of wooden buildings, uh, they're not really in good shape sometimes. Like you, it's uh, again, um, if, if there is an opportunity, of course, the government tries to rebuild them, to restore them, to uh, again, to bring them back uh, to a better view. And again, when we walk in the Rakus, you see so many wooden buildings, again, you take it for granted. But again, lots of cities, again, in Europe, uh, where also some buildings were built of wood. Uh, they lost them during the wars, yeah, Second World War, pretty much uh, de uh, destroying almost all the wooden architecture pieces. So we have literally two cities, Tomsk and Irkutsk, in Siberia, keeping a lot of wooden buildings. Um, and again, when we really go uh, to see uh, Irkutsk streets, the main street is called Karmak Street. And I'd like to show you, um, again, three views of uh, the city Main Street, Karmak Street, that was, again, this um, uh, street was uh, the competition ground for merchant families uh, to show off, to really present the best architectural designs coming from St. Petersburg, taking the best architects' idea, ideas and, again, um, trying to build a lot of uh, buildings in that on that street. That's why when you go there, it's literally the place where you feel yourself in some locations, again, very much similar to what Nevsky Prospect in St. Petersburg. So you can clearly see uh, the same. Again, it's not really that tall architecture. No skyscrapers in the city. Uh, but it's more the splendid 19th century designs that you find in St. Petersburg and again in many other European cities. And that's why Anton Chekhov, uh, when he looked at Rakosk, when he talked with people, he could really see, well, it has a lot of designs. The city is far away, again, from the European part of the country, but the city managed to do so many things that not, so many, not, many really, not really matched by lots of other like, uh, people. So when we go to the next like view, these are beautiful cities, and again, when you like in Moscow, it's also nice to walk in, in the areas, not in the, only in the main street, but then the streets, which is in, again, and in in Moscow uh, uh, names again, we have Piriulok, okay, we have these side streets where you can uh, walk around and uh, see the beauty of more quiet, relaxed life of ordinary citizens. And the next year, again, we have lots of fountains, again, lots of monuments, lots of things, again, uh, something historical. Again, there are newer buildings, of course, uh, just like in, in many other bigger uh, uh, cities, uh, where you can actually uh, see some beautiful designs, some, some different other, like, uh, parks and uh, places. So, again, that's a certain... I would say, a uh, feature of Rakutsk, where you have uh, actually many places where you can walk. And again, walking is another thing that I, uh, at, first, at, first, uh, at first when I came to America, I was, uh, I was shocked uh, to see that people don't normally walk, they drive. And this is the trend now for our society. Rakutsk is the city where you can drive, it's not like Moscow where you 
basically don't really have a good opportunity because of the traffic jams. Uh, so you use the subway system. No subway here. The city has 600,000 people, so we don't really have subway uh, uh, development. But uh, yes, there are uh, lots of different uh, traffic jams. But it's possible for uh, for lots of citizens to use public transportation and also to drive if you want to again and get in anywhere uh, just using your own car. It's of course it has become much much easier, uh, especially during these quarantine times. Uh, so we go to the next uh, slide, and I want to show you the piece that connects us with the United States. This is the story of Grigory Shelikov, who was also a merchant. He is not really coming from a Kursk family of merchants. He came here, he found that, uh, again, he prospered. He created a lot of wealth um, trading with China. And then he started investing his wealth in, this, in his own expeditions, going to Alaska. And you can see the expansion of the Russian Empire. And it turns out that Rakutsk, being a political center, being a hub of many, many uh, like uh, routes that we find here in Siberia, roads connecting us with different places. Rakutsk was a place where... Uh, 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 merchants, uh, they try to find more different animals, uh, pelts, furs, and Alaska was the next place. At that time, it was not really um, uh, known uh, to uh, uh, many people in the in the world. Uh, lots of these uh, remote uh, places were discovered and uh, very well described by Bering. Uh, there were other Russian uh, these travelers who came to this location. Uh, to this location. So, uh, uh, Grigory Sherikov is the person who built forts, who created cities in uh, in the present day America, uh, Alaska. So uh, he uh, sent expedition after expedition. Then it was Remezov who actually married the daughter of Shelikov, who came to Alaska, who came with his circumnavigational expedition of Kruzenstern and Lisetsky, and he came to later to Fort Ross. And so this is another, uh, again, in a very famous uh, musical of Russia coming from uh, Leningrad and Petersburg, you know the Navo story. But it's also about the Russian presence in Alaska. And so Irkutsk it was there, again, the first city, again, where the Russian-American company was uh, founded. We have actually the building that uh, was, the, was used by the Russian-American traders. And then, of course, the uh, um, Remesov decided to move it uh, closer to St. Petersburg, again, to St. Petersburg, so the government would be interested in uh, getting to this land. So I uh, specifically named Shelikov again. It's a certain feature, again, for us to understand that Irkutsk was not only a small city at that time. Irkutsk was not only a small city at that time. It was, of course, much smaller than today. But in reality, it controlled huge territories because the governors lived here in Irkutsk. They controlled these areas of eastern Siberia, uh, going to Yakutia, going to Kamchatka, Chukotka, Alaska. That was also supervision of the Irkutsk authorities at that time. So, um, uh, one of these features of Russian Orthodox life was this missionary work. And I have Orthodox Church Center uh, that is renovated. It's in Angan, actually, to the north of Irkutsk. This is the small village uh, located on the Lena uh, River banks. But this is where the very famous uh, uh, missionary and also the person who became later a saint of Inakinti really comes from. One thing when we talk about Russia in these uh, historical times, we need to remember one thing, and this is another very, very interesting aspect, that there was no serfdom. Serfdom, for some of you who Russians don't know this term, this is Kripasno Prava. It, it, again, it didn't exist. The, the, there wasn't any serfdom here in Siberia. All this day, again, these peasants who made up the majority, the vast majority of the population, they, uh, they were free. Uh, they were free, again, as state, uh, uh, again, peasants. They lived in these communities of villages. So one thing, when you travel to uh, different museums, you find one thing, that in Siberia, the main thing, again, is to warm up. Another thing is, again, you can only get things. You can only harvest uh, 
the grain and other products being together in a collective uh, certain labor force. So these peasants lived in the villages and again uh, could find more and more tracts of land. Land was uh, actually much bigger here and again people could uh, uh, manage easily finding fish again finding lots of other resources. One thing as a historian, uh, that is actually very, very interesting to see that in reality, life here was much better than in the in, in other parts of the, uh, of the country. Because again, there wasn't any famine. In reality, there was fish. Uh, yeah, there were difficult times during the wars, especially the Second World War, but uh, there wasn't anything uh, like we know uh, the story of, of course, uh, the famine in the Volga area or Ukraine later. So uh, this, uh, this uh, peasants were actually richer if you look at the Siberian population and they could uh, have more property, uh, more resources for them, for themselves. So if you go uh, and travel, let's say in Buryatia to some of these old villages, you find that Again, these uh, peasants, they could sometimes make a lot of uh, money, uh, again, participating in this trade, but also selling, providing goods and resources. So uh, one thing that uh, usually people also know about Siberia, and there is a recent film about Decembris. It's a story of Decembris being here in Irkutsk. Um, so the uh, December story uh, goes that, again, for, at first they were sent to the Chita area, but later the Tsar allowed them to stay and live close to Turku. Some of them, December's like Trubetskoy and Volkonsky, they stayed and lived here in the city of Turku. Some of them, uh, again, their relatives, uh, their, uh, uh, like, wife, like, for example, uh, Trubitskaya, Katerina Trubitskaya, she died here later. Uh, so the, the same fate actually waited for, for, for their children. But again, so in, in reality, uh, many of them moved out later of Siberia, uh, their descendants, and actually we find more Decembrist families now scattered around the world, but mostly in the United States and also in France and Belgium and other countries. So this is the story of Decembrist. It's a very interesting moment how the locals, uh, they treat the Sampras because for them they were the people of the highest education, of the highest aristocratic stock that you could find. Of course, in Siberia, lots of people were peasants. Uh, that these traders were sent from St. Petersburg. Um, uh, in, in reality, uh, uh, not so many people could see and communicate easily with uh, the representative of this very, very high uh, aristocratic families. So mm, the influence was tremendous. Uh, they brought a lot of innovations, for example, Maria Valkonska, whose house we see here, uh, she uh, brought lots of biological uh, plants and trees and also tried to provide us with um, uh, some, again, uh, specific evenings, uh, readings, poems. This is sort of feature of Russia. Poems are very, very much important. We take it for granted. But again, it's very, very different than other countries. Uh, talking about literature, talking about reading, knowledge of languages. Again, all these aspirations, they were really, uh, I would say, uh, uh, shown, first of all, in the lives of Decembers, but then affected, of course, the whole society, especially here in Irkutsk. So the impact is, again, uh, is uh, very, very tremendous. And one thing that we find, uh, for example, in the next slide, is the White House. Irkutsk is actually happy to have the second White House which, uh, which is only four years younger than the American counterpart in, in Washington. It's, uh, again, Kvarenge design, very, very beautiful building belonging to Turku State University. So it has, again, the, like the, this was the center of governor's office, administrator's office. We find um, uh, lots of, uh, uh, again, uh, productive, uh, efficient works of these governors. One of that was the, um, yeah, the Russian uh, move to the east, and Moravia Fomursky, who is uh, probably the most famous governor, resided in this building, signing lots of different uh, treaties with, uh, with the Chinese. So that is again the legacy of, the, uh, of this 19th century architecture. Another very, very famous uh, feature of Siberia, and for many people it was exile. 
uh, exile, and again, there was also exile where people had to be banished. They had to leave their own places, and they had to stay and live in Irkutsk. And it turns out that Irkutsk was the main hub, not only for the Russians and the Burets, of course, who lived nearby, who lived to the north of Irkutsk, to the south of Irkutsk, uh, but also to many other different groups who came here voluntarily and sometimes not voluntarily. One of those groups that I want to emphasize or the Poles, that for a long period of time, Poles made up a very big chunk of the population because so many of them were sent after the uprising against the Tsar in the 1860s. And that's why Irkutsk really has a very active Polish society with lots of, again, people uh, who came from Poland. Mm. They contributed a lot to the intellectual development of uh, many different branches of sciences because they were teachers, because they were very well educated. So we really have Poles who are very different from the Poles from Chicago. So Poles, Polish last name usually means one thing. It's a very arist high aristocratic, uh, aristocratic uh, 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 class background uh, because, again, they were all very well educated. They were the ones who thought critically about many things. They came in uh, to Irkutsk, they lived, they actually mixed with the Russian population. Now it's more assimilated, of course, population, but we still have legacy. We have um, beautiful Catholic churches. It's another story. Irkutsk is multi-ethnic and also multi-religious center, having many different groups who came here and stayed here and uh, became very famous, uh, like Poles, they, uh, there were so many famous researchers of Lake Baikal, those people who came to many geological expeditions. Another very interesting aspect is the Irkutsk Jewish life. We have actually one of the most beautiful synagogues in Russia, and also Irkutsk Jewish community is actually very, very important in their commercial life, in the business life, in the political life of the, of the city. And I would say we know generally Birabijan as being the center of the Jewish homes, but it's actually a smaller uh, settlement and it's a very remote one. We also have Jewish people, of course, living in St. Petersburg and Moscow and Novosibirsk. Uh, but it turns out that Irkutsk probably, I would say, is one of the uh, biggest cities uh, with, uh, uh, for the people uh, with Jewish roots. So literally, when you start communicating with lots of people, Irkutsk residents, uh, people say, well, yes, my ancestors, they were Jewish. So it's pretty much like half of the people I know probably in Irkutsk here, they have Jewish roots. So that, that's, just, again, that's a very, very interesting aspect of life. And again, it talks about multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious. For example, this Jewish synagogue is located on the same street where we have also the um, uh, Muslim-specific uh, 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 center. Uh, so it's uh, uh, pretty much mosque and synagogue, they really are well, not like several uh, like hundred meters away from each other. So going to this contribution of lots of people of science, lots of people who came here to research, that's Geographic Society Expeditions. They were all coming from this building that I want to show. Uh, there were a lot of explorations of the Central Asia, of the Arctic, of Lake Baikal. It was organized by this society. And Rikusk was the hub, again, that uh, tried to bring more knowledge, more information about many different remote lands or unknown territories. Going a little bit further, uh, and that is again a very, very interesting feature of Russia, uh, um, the revolution. Uh, Irkutsk was far away from Napoleonic Wars, was far away from most of other uh, conflicts of uh, 300 Russian history. It was far away from the Second World War. Uh, so the city was right in like the backbone of the Soviet industry at that time. But the city suffered tremendously during the revolution and the civil war. Uh, literally, the city was the second in the confrontation uh, after Moscow, right after the October revolution in, in, in Petrograd at that time. So we have the highest, like the second uh, death toll because so many people who were merchants who were officers, Cossacks, they fought against those who were from proletariat or pe peasant background. Uh, and uh, the streets of this uh, city, they were damaged during those uh, years of the Civil War. We were right in the heart of the Kolchak, and there is a story of Kolchak 
that uh, is being discussed even now. It's again a story about monuments. Literally, we have the monument to Alex, uh, the Kolchak, who spent a lot of time in the course here. And again, for lots of people, he uh, has again he was the leader of the anti-Bolshevik forces. At the same time, yes, he was um, uh, the very famous uh, scientist, and uh, there are still like some discussions and arguments against him uh, about him. So when we talk about Irkutsk and the legacy, some people say even of Kolchak, but this is actually the Soviet development that really tremendously changed a lot of things here. That Irkutsk became this university hub for lots of residents, not only of the oblast but also eastern Siberia, a far east, and we have uh, a lot of people as well. Like basically one fifth of the population, uh, these are students who come here for some period of time, they study. And again, there are so many universities, not only Russian students, but again, we have Chinese students coming to the, let's say, BRICS programs. Yeah, we have lots of students who come uh, from uh, like Europe and the United States. Like I personally work with Middlebury programs uh, with the students coming from the School of Russian and Asian Studies. So we have a lot of uh, students uh, coming from other lands and they all find this fascinating cultural life, nightlife, lots of other opportunities that city really can provide. Another interesting aspect of the city, there are many people who are born in Siberia, uh, in, in, in especially in the Irkutsk area. We like Matsuev, yeah, because he's coming from here. But we have lots of other like, uh, famous people, and probably there is not really much time to discuss all of them. But, for example, the monument to the Soviet director, Gaidai, uh, who uh, spent a lot of time, again, in Irkutsk, uh, and it's a very famous film that some of you who watch the Soviet comedies, this is one of the best ones, uh, can really recognize. Again, Gaidai comedy is considered to be the best of the best, and again, he comes from Irkutsk. The city also has a theater, this orange color, beautiful building, uh, made by the main architect of Russia, uh, Schroeder, at the end of the 19th century, is a masterpiece. The city is, uh, um, uh, first of all, is very fascinated because of these theatrical uh, performances, uh, activities, that uh, cultural activities that are constantly provided for us. And so the next piece that I would like to also to emphasize is embankment. In other words, it's a riverside. And this is actually a very, very beautiful promenade the place where you can walk and run and exercise. And it's a very, very long stretch of, uh, of this uh, boulevard, and, uh, where, uh, w which we take for granted. But this is something that I missed in America, because you don't really find this like huge rivers. Yeah? Uh, so we don't really like, uh, 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 we, we think that it's everywhere. But in, in reality, this is something, this is the masterpiece of Arcus, because it's a beautiful fresh air from the Angara River. Remember, the river, the only river coming from Lake Baikal. Irkutsk is very, very happy to have this um, clean water in our pipes. It has also this proximity to nature. Nature is all around us. It's only one hour like away, like by, like by Kal, Istanka. Uh, it's, uh, for many people, it's 15 minute, 20 minute ride, and it's a duchess, this, this idea of your own land and plot of land where you can have your raspberry bushes, honeysuckles, and many other things. This is, uh, this is a feature that, again, led us here. It's around us. It's, uh, we really come and visit so many different destinations, and we think it's like everywhere else. So just you really find this nature around you. Uh, in reality, this is, of course, a pearl of, of something that we have here in Siberia. Another interesting thing, again, it's a beautiful winter. I show this Talsi village, open a wooden uh, architecture museum, and winter <laughs> has this beauty. This is what we call white uh, Christmas. Dreaming of white Christmas, well, it's you don't need to dream. It's a reality here in Siberia. There's usually a lot of snow, uh, and the snow is sparkling white. It's so beautiful, and lots of wooden things that you can do. Of course, winter sports that you can exercise. Summer sports you can exercise here. River activities you can really um, like find all the time in this uh, water reservoir. So it's a reality of our life. Uh, what we find it's a, it's the first question that we might be ask us if you come here. Uh, okay, we'd like to go to bike. Okay, uh, do you go on this trail? Yeah, basically, it's one thing people, when they ask you about the weekend, 
uh, well, before again, these times, uh, everybody is expected to say that you at least travel to like by call, maybe once you go somewhere, uh, simply to stay. Again, camping is common. Again, uh, boat rides, fishing, all these things that you think, well, this is a certain feature that we. Mm, uh, again, uh, we can find it uh, very, very peculiar. And Irkutsk Dam, uh, this is uh, the uh, very uh, actually famous Soviet construction, change of course climate here. This is something that, again, for those who are from Russia, you need to understand that dams are not really uh, a good idea for many, many American uh, planners right now. So dams are actually changed in America. But in reality, here we have a lot of dam constructions that provide us with, um, uh, I think, the cheapest energy in the world. The cost of electricity is about, like, maybe... Right now, maybe five dollars. Again, it depends, of course, how much you consume. But in reality, five dollars per month. Before it was, I think, one dollar, two dollars per month. You really have for the whole sometimes like uh, like apartment uh, to use monthly. So you can again uh, in America the bills are very very high. And again, this is something that we take for granted: cheapest electricity, cleanest water in our pipes. But also another thing that again lots of people sometimes can acknowledge: they really have the form. Um, I'm talking about is connected with the cheapest electricity. It's Bitcoin. So Bitcoin industry, something in the air. Again, uh, we really have uh, lots of speculations right now whether it's going to be like uh, continued. Lots of stories about Bitcoin, but that's a certain reality that people have minds. And uh, from time to time in the press, you find that lots of organizations sometimes invest into that. So another interesting thing, and that is. Uh, um, mm. Uh, what I really have is uh, the malls that are uh, really omnipotent. You can find them in many different locations. Something that I, when I came to, from America in the 1990s, I was talking about malls and I had to explain what it is. Um, uh, it, the malls, again, just this new architecture, contemporary architecture, we find, again, all of this interesting uh uh, new innovations, economic boom, architecture of the zeros. Uh, people call it sometimes Putin's boom. Uh, yes, the city really benefited. Uh, the city really changed to the better. So those who remember Kursk of the 1990s, where there were not really many different architectural projects, uh, when I came to Bloomington, Illinois, there were lots of projects. Yeah, it was American economic boom of the 1990s. So uh, you, in the Kursk, Pretty much there wasn't anything built but then of course in the zeros lots of things lots of streets they were uh, they really changed to the better they're one of the main pearls i think uh, a certain masterpiece for lots of other um, uh, and some certain idea for many other different cities in siberia is the so-called 130 district this district that really recreated a lot of wooden architecture buildings uh, of the 19th century and it's uh, like a tourist a restaurant nightlife uh, street and holidays. This is, again, magnificent, um, especially in May and June. We used to have a lot of fireworks, something that we miss. We don't really have them, of course, this year. Uh, but again, these fireworks and also celebrations, uh, we think it's normal. It's like everywhere else, but not really. Uh, this is a certain feature like 9th of May. I talked about Victory Day. This is the, the very famous city parade. Very, very famous uh, participation of so many different groups, society uh, uh, classes, of course, in this particular event. And you really can um, see people uh, participating uh, freely and uh, happily. Uh, a lot of celebrations, a lot of dances, for example, for like uh, for the participants, uh, uh, activities to play. Something that I didn't really see. The 4th of July, yeah, uh, in America you really have, but maybe not really so much communication. This is one thing. We like to walk in the city a lot and also we like to communicate, especially during like holidays, uh, like the celebrations. Uh, uh, we really can, uh, can see uh, this... Uh, I would say a happy mood of the population where people dance, interact, they can they communicate, participate in different activities. Um, lots of ethnic organizations are invited to uh, provide classes and master classes. So it's it's one thing that you constantly need to learn something specific, something new for yourself. It's a certain mind in the course where you want to. Uh, 
get better, okay, to change something to the better. Uh, also to think about ourselves as, well, it's a capital city. It's not really a provincial city. Uh, we are, we really have great history. We really have a lot of things that we don't even treasure. Lots of people here don't even treasure lot, uh, all these things that I have mentioned today. So, Irkutsk, and I, again, I, I leave it here today with a monument to the Tsar. Talking about monuments, we have a lot of monuments. We have revolutionary names changed in the revolution and nothing changed here. We have monuments of Lenin. We have, re we have rebuilt the monument to Alexander. This is our legacy. This is again who we are, okay? The, uh, the people living in this far remote land. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for your All right, okay, allow, uh, I think it's going to be the time for questions, yeah, so let me see uh, whether, okay, I can try to read them, so let's go now to the question, uh, question session, so we are going to, uh, to see, all right, okay, so I have question number one, okay, uh, do people uh, who come from Arkutsk have any personality traits that are distinct from those of people who come from other parts of Russia? Okay. What is the Arkutsk character? Very, very interesting um, uh, question. And thinking about the personality traits, um, I think this is something that I, I, I uh, uh, can explain that um, when we talk about Siberia especially, we are considered to be much more tolerant, okay? Maybe uh, not that emotional, which is not really true, of course, uh, but in, in reality, Siberians are perceived as those who are very much re resistant in many cases, also persevere, meaning that we can... Um, uh, try to overcome difficulties. We don't surrender. Um, again, uh, Siberians like to boast that Siberian uh, armies really played a very decisive role uh, defeating the Nazi uh, like armies near Moscow in 1941. So, uh, but in reality, yes, the, I have again. Um, sometimes maybe it's uh, some certain stereotype, but maybe it's based on some certain features. Because generally, who are the people who live here? Uh, first of all, they were these pioneers who came uh, from very, very remote lands and uh, from European part of the country first. And uh, they had to go through like a very big, vast tracts of land. So meaning that if you really surrender, if you really, uh, again, weak, you die. So uh, those people who came here, they uh, stayed and also uh, 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 basically uh, left lots of descendants who also uh, like, uh, probably inherited some of the traits. Uh, so living in Siberia, it's a certain collective, first of all, uh, idea that you need to uh, communicate, you need to trade, you need to also to uh, help uh, and uh, uh, provide help. And so in many cases, sometimes some people say that people are responsive, they uh, are much more open, uh, they are interested, let's say, in learning about uh, foreign culture because it's interesting. It's a certain part of our, again, curiosity that we have. Uh, so, Rakus character, I'm not sure about that. But maybe Rakus Kalba's character, lots of people who came here, let's say, those who came in the Soviet period, where there were lots of strikes and so many buildings. Uh, with, uh, again, this determination, uh, so uh, with determination to build, to create, to change. That's why when we talk about BAM by Kalamur uh, Railway, okay, those people who stayed, okay, who uh, had their children and their grandchildren, well, they had this motivation, again, to participate in great uh, uh, feats, in the great uh conquest of nature for them at that time, but again, to contribute something to the society, to expect again that this is my land and this is my country. So in many cases, yes, I, 
I haven't found any specific uh, studies on that, but it's a very, again, very interesting question. So going now to question number two, as an independent traveler, is it easy to travel from Moscow to Irkutsk? Oh, yes. Yeah, so generally, it's, uh, again, it's, uh, yeah, I think two days ago, Irkutsk opened up, and we started having all these tourists coming from uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg before. It was this two-week requirement, uh, quarantine. Uh, but now I think Irkutsk opened up. Meaning, of course, that uh, uh, there'll be probably still some difficulties in communication and traveling again. Uh, so, but um, January, uh, uh, it was rather fast from Moscow, uh, five-hour flight. Remember, it's five hours when you fly from Moscow to Irkutsk, and it's around six hours when you fly from Irkutsk to Moscow because of the rotation of the Earth. Uh, so, and then trains, it's about three days. Trains, uh, well, if you have time, uh, generally the price might be similar. And again, you generally see Taiga Forest, Taiga Forest all this period of time. So sometimes it's not really practical to take a train now. And since we have more competition of, of uh, air companies, uh, uh, basically lots of people used air. All right, next question. Uh, question number three. Question number three, does Irkutsk have any unique dishes or foods? Uh, like in Tula, there is, okay. Um, well, it's omelet. So when we talk about uh, very, very delicious uh, things, uh, omelet is an endemic species. It's a fish coming from Lake Baikal. Uh, right now, there is a ban on omelet. But still, you can find, of course, that in, in Listvanka and you know, lots of other uh, places where people, the traders, they have the quota given to the local, like native uh, people of the northern part of Lake Baikal. Uh, and again, they can sell this to you. Uh, omelet omel can be hot, uh, small and cold smoked so these are the two things that uh, we uh, li like uh, th there are two ways how we consume omel so it has uh, it's a specific it's basically fish fish is the cheapest actually when you think about that we can buy in the market like pike and uh, we take we use we consume a lot of fish uh, also cedar nuts this is another very famous uh, treat a delicatessen coming from Lake Baikal and um, that is uh, um, uh, also when we talk about uh, like pine cones. So these are the, these are the main like very very important things. All right, um, that's uh, basically I think it today. So thank you so much for your attention, and uh, again thank you for your questions. I really hope you uh, uh, that you would enjoy uh, your time here with me. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you.